So I will share my screen. And um, Okay. See here. I have a dog licking my hand. Google wants me to re log in. Here's the first of several pauses during our, our class today. Here we go. Okay. So let's get into it. Are you seeing all the Zoom gobbledygook on my screen? Or are you seeing the slides? See slides. So no, so no, you don't see any zoom. Zoom noise here. No. Okay. Excellent. All right then. So here we are, in the final stretch of our of our eleven topics, of the course, uh, before we get to the term project and uh, the last three of these topics are city as an organism, city as a machine, and city as a cosmos. And these three topics have historically and traditionally been taught as the first three topics of other courses uh, that emerge out of this tradition of teaching the history and theory of cities to architects. And this is this is the kind of course that you can find in architecture schools all over the world. And many of them are deeply indebted and influenced by the course as it was taught in MIT. And so uh, Manuel and I are the product of this teaching tradition, as we've mentioned previously. We took this course at MIT, not from Kevin Lynch, but from Julian Beinart, who in inherited the course from Kevin Lynch. Kevin Lynch, you may uh, have heard the name. He is the author of perhaps the second most important book for architects to read about cities in the 20th century, or maybe even ever. Um, Kevin Lynch is the author of the book, um, not just of Good City Form, as uh, shown here, but of the image of the city, where there are five, uh, five uh, structures that seem to imprint on human minds in the way we register cities. So that's his most famous contribution. Uh, but more importantly for us uh, today, He's also uh, the author of a book called Good City Form, which is really the, uh, grew out of the, um, the course at MIT that Manuel and I took um, that forms the foundation of this course. And the first three topics in that course are, are, are in this book. Um, and so here's just, you know, you might be interested in reading further uh, if, if the topic of this course interests you, um, of reading more deeply 
uh, and this is an excellent uh, book um, that you will recognize many of the ideas in this book as lying at the foundation of this course. And so there's one chapter in this book called uh, Three Normative Theories. And those three normative theories are city as an organism, city as a machine, city as a cosmos. And those are the final three topics of uh, this course. And so why do we care about uh, these three normative theories? What do they do to help us? Well, um, they help us recognize, uh, even if we're looking at the history of cities way, way, way back in time, uh, these three normative theories actually uh, lie underneath all the complexity of the world as we experience it today and as you will experience it as you move into um, your careers and the peak of your careers, which of course is the reference point for this course. What do we wish we knew back in 2021? Uh, what do we wish our schooling had offered us in terms of understanding back in 2021 that is going to help us face the challenges of the world here in 2050. Uh, and so um, these three normative theories are really useful for understanding. And I would say that this one, the, the city as an organism, is the biggest challenge of architects and urbanists uh, moving into the 21st century. Uh, there is a level of complexity to uh, these uh, phenomena, these challenges that are unprecedented in human history. And we just don't have the tools here in 2021 to understand the, the wealth and range and depth of the phenomena that we are experiencing and really have to understand in order to, uh, to face and the challenges that we have to face in the 21st century. So this first slide is in reference to um, a socio-religious practice on the island of Bali. Uh, there are water temples all over uh, this part of Bali. And uh, we in the West uh, look upon it as quaint and, and interesting, but really not consequential to much of anything. It's sure there are Hindu, these are, this is a deeply devout Hindu Balinese religious um, set of practices and the landscape is peppered with these temples, but what's the big deal? So in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, the World Bank and other international organizations went all over the world with their scientifically bred uh, rice species and other plant species in order to solve the world hunger problem and increase productivity. And an interesting thing happened. And interesting is a polite way to put it, a, a terrifying thing happened in Bali. After one or two or three years of success, suddenly the rice yields faltered. And it wasn't, it was disappointing, but not catastrophic. But in year uh, five, six, seven, the, uh, the pest, uh, the water scarcity, the strain on the crops led to widespread uh, shortfalls and starvation and people died. And uh, quickly the rice farmers abandoned the scientific approaches of the international experts and went back to their religious practices, which were invisible to even the Balinese government, even the Balinese government officials who grew up farming rice did not appreciate how sophisticated uh, the socio-religious practice of these temples and priests were to the operation of the rice fields and the rice yields. And so um, a, 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 a team of anthropologists and computer scientists flooded into Bali around the same time I was working in Bali um, they came in and I met a few of them and they were struggling to come up with a computer model that was sophisticated enough to help us understand how the religious practices of Bali uh, operated to, uh, to control the, uh, 
uh, rice harvest and, and to keep a balance between water scarcity, uh, how do you share scarce water resources uh, uh, between competing individual farms, competing individual villages. If, um, if it weren't for the priests and the temple system, the villages upstream and the farmers upstream would have all the water they want and then lower down in the uh, irrigation systems they would be at the mercy of the farmers upstream. But because of the religious uh, system uh, of temples and priests, uh, they were at, for over a thousand years, one of the highest population density areas in the world have been able to feed their populations. Uh, and in retrospect, it is not just a marvel. It is something we are still struggling to, to more fully understand computer models fall short of being able to replicate the sophistication and complexity of this socio-religious practice. And so here, um, Stephen Lansing uh, and Marie Cox have written a book about uh, how complexity operates in real world systems. Here is a vivid demonstration of uh, what I was talking about in the first lecture when I said, I am number four. Uh, the, uh, on a good day, I'm the fourth most important source of understanding. The most important source of understanding is the world itself. The second most important source of understanding are the tools are offered by the tools of our discipline of architecture by drawing sections and doing uh, these highlighting of aerial perspectives. We use the tools of our discipline to reveal So Robert, it's connected. Okay, so we have, I think we are here. We have to wait. You're muted. But you are going to do, this is what you are going to have to do moving forward. Do you hear me now? How's that? Do you hear me now? Yes, we can. Great. So this is what you're going to have to do moving forward is take these understandings of the complexity of the world, fold it into the design processes and believe it or not, uh, work with these complex forces uh, in the design that you produce for the world. And um, believe it or not, you are already doing this in studio but you're gonna do it even more intensely moving forward in the fall studios, uh, in the thesis program, and uh, in the working world of your careers. And so uh, this, this lecture is really an introduction to that complexity. We cannot teach you how to deal with this complexity because the tools that you will need during your lifetimes have not yet been invented. Uh, and that's really what this book is all about, The Islands of Order. Um, computers, for all their uh, great power, really fall short. They really are dominated by linear modeling. Uh, for those of you who took math and who didn't, um, there are linear models uh, that uh, are 
the, most of the mathematics that we learn in college and in high school are dominated by linear uh, models, linear approximations of much more complex phenomena. And the point that Lansing and Murray make in this book are that because of the domination of these tools in what we do day in, day out, things that are not explained by these tools are rendered invisible. Exactly uh, what happened in Bali is that because our mathematical and computer and all the tools of our thinking were incapable of even uh, understanding the complexity of the world, it made that complexity more or less invisible to us. We did not see it, we did not appreciate it, and uh, we, we broke the whole system. And only after the system was broken by our overly simplistic modeling of it uh, did we gain an appreciation of complexity. And now we're scrambling to develop uh, the tools. Maybe artificial intelligence holds some hope, um, but don't hold your breath. Uh, and so this is very much uh, the reason, one of the reasons this topic is so damn important to us is uh, the reaction that we all have when we see informal settlements. When we encounter these informal settlements in Caracas, uh, in Medellin, uh, throughout Africa, throughout Asia, in Mumbai, um, we are overwhelmed throughout Latin America uh, we're just overwhelmed. We don't have the tools. Architecture school just didn't prepare us to even understand what's going on here. Um, uh, we somehow imagine that people are moving from house to house through each other's houses because we don't see in this image, we don't see the actual individual pathways that would bring us from one household to the next. Uh, Believe it or not, they exist. People are not passing through each other's houses. They do have privacy. So once we understand that, uh, we look more deeply and hopefully we're able to identify where the path, where the circulation patterns. What is the circulation pattern of this settlement? This would be an excellent analysis, for example. This is too high of an, uh, a point of view, but from a lower, if you fly your that uh, it is up to us to uh, rise to the challenge of these types of built environments, that we need to understand them. You will be working in places that are very different from where you grew up, and uh, it is our professional obligation to uh, do whatever we can to understand the place uh, so as to avoid the kind of catastrophe that happened in Bali in the 80s with starvation, with, with serious consequences. And so um, this is not an informal settlement. This is a historic um, Medina. Uh, this is a, a, a place um, uh, in Islamic city. This is uh, an old Islamic settlement at the center of some city somewhere um, I'm going to say in Africa um, or in the Middle East. Um, so Islam is uh, an excellent thing for us to look at because uh, like Hindu Balinese tradition that has profound implications for the built environment and the landscape. Uh, Islam, as you saw in the reading for today, uh, does not shy away from embracing the fact that the built form of our houses, of our neighborhoods, of our cities are fundamentally involved in the pursuit of the goals of Islam. And so the Uh, 
of uh, how complexity can work. Uh, we look at uh, built for fabrics like this and we are dumbfounded, we are stymied, we, it defies our understanding of how cities work and so we call it uh, chaotic, we call it uh, primitive, we dismiss it as being a total unordered mess. But is it really an unordered mess? Well, that's what the colonial architects felt. And so they went throughout the world and every chance they had, they bulldozed these neighborhoods and replaced them with proper European style um, urban forms. And if you look around, especially the colonial capitals of Africa, the French uh, were experimenting with ideas that were later uh, applied to Paris uh, by um, Haussmann. Uh, remember the Haussmann topic? Uh, so you see prototype trials of Haussmann's transformation of Paris. You see them applied to Algiers and Casablanca and Fez and cities throughout the French colonial world. Uh, similarly, the Dutch, the English, the Germans, the Italians, they are all experimenting with urban form. And because of the ignorance about the sophistication and importance of uh, these uh, Islamic cores of these ancient cities, many of these cities were either demolished outright or at least um, eroded and undermined and partially lost. And so, uh, it's an interesting example because uh, the, the rules that underlie these forms are difficult to fathom. Uh, often in architecture, we, uh, we arrive at a site and we're asked to, to understand, to analyze the forces that are driving the formation that we encounter. And in this case, it's very, very difficult until you read uh, this chapter from Hisham Murtada's book, uh, where he breaks down, he goes through the Quran and the Hadith. The Hadith is an interpretive document that helps us understand uh, how the Quran has been interpreted over the centuries. Uh, and uh, so he looks at the Quran, the Hadith, the, uh, the results of centuries of legal decisions being made in Islamic courts of law to understand what is the building code embedded in Islamic teachings uh, and practice. The building codes uh, that generate this form and account and give us an understanding of the complexity of these forms. And so um, in previous years, we talked a bit about the history of Islam, um, but I'm not sure that is uh, the best use of our time. Um, suffice it to say, um, Muhammad the prophet uh, uh, was a merchant from the city of Medina, and he uh, received the revelation of God. Uh, he is the inheritor of the Abra Abrahamic uh, religions, uh, which are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. All of them uh, trace their roots back to Abraham. And in the year 634, Muhammad receives the revelation of Allah, uh, and he documents it in the Quran, and off we go. Islam is off and running. Now, something that is really interesting for architects to understand about Islam is that unlike uh, the caricature of Islam that you see in action movies and um, poorly researched uh, cartoonish representations of Islam, Islam is an extremely tolerant cosmopolitan religion at its core. Its central purpose, the Prophet Muhammad's central purpose, what he had to do, what he had to achieve politically was he had to unify these extremely divisive tribes that dominated the Arabian Peninsula, uh, each warring faction competing with the other warring faction in this very Islam, in order to overcome this separation, had to take a profoundly cosmopolitan approach that uh, 
whereby uh, it did not impose its cultural forms on local uh, uh, tribes and local cultures. It said, it basically said, we in Islam embrace all expressions, uh, cultural expressions. Islam can adapt as, as a hybrid cultural formation. If you build your buildings uh, as round, we can deal with that. So the mosque uh, in parts of Africa are round. Uh, if you design, if you build buildings as uh, rectilinear or square buildings, we can do that. So throughout Southeast Asia, the mosque form is a square building with four pillars and stacked roofs just like it is in Hindu Balinese religion. Uh, and so you have different architectures that manifest differently all over the world, wherever this religion spread. And it spread very quickly. Uh, and it unified uh, huge swaths of the world and dominated for, what is it, seven centuries in Spain, Manuel? Um, and that's why the Spanish language uh, has, if you pick up a Spanish language dictionary, you look at the A section, and it's the fattest section of the Spanish language dictionary because so many words in Spanish come from the Arabic, uh, algebra. Um, Manuel, help me out. I'm, I'm blanking all my A words in Spanish. Alzucar, sugar. But there's so many. Those are my two favorite, algebra and sugar. And part of the sophistication. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a mute. Alhambra, the Granada Alhambra is one of the beautiful buildings in Cordoba. In, Al in Granada, I'm sorry. Yeah. But all the Spanish words that we don't expect to have any relationship to Islam, uh, Arabic, um, but they're all there. And throughout Latin America, we see Islamic architectural forms, those porches that hang out off the side of buildings. That's an Islamic yeah. form. <clears throat> so That's it's a correct. fascinating topic. It goes very deep. We don't have time. Um, one of the things that's worth noting is there is an architectural order that is fundamentally global. In Islam, uh, and I'm sure that uh, several of our, our colleagues here who are Muslim or were raised in a Muslim tradition can explain this much better than, than I can. Um, if we were in a classroom, this is the point at which I'd uh, invite uh, all the uh, people who grew up in Muslim traditions to speak out. Um, I don't know if Jaime, no, I don't think. Actually, I'm not seeing. Ah, Zahra, do you know anything mm -hmm. about, can you help us out here, get this right? Well, if you hear, hear me say something wrong, please correct me. And I apologize ahead of time. Uh, were you, did you mean me? Yes. Do you know anything about Islam uh, from personal experience growing up? Uh, yeah, like what would you like to know? Like the culture or the religion itself? Yeah, in the religion, uh, we pray five times a day and we face um, this uh, cube. Yeah, the we Kaaba. are in the world. Yeah, the Kaaba. Um, oh. Five times a day. Do we have to go to a mosque to pray? No, you can pray at home. You can pray anywhere, honestly. Um, you, um, yeah. Go ahead. No, continue. You were saying something. Um, can we pray? So if we're traveling, can we just stop the car and pull over and pray? Yeah, I've done that before. When me and my parents would go on like, long car rides, we stop at like a gas station or something mm -hmm. and pray on the side. And uh, is it a specific time of day we pray? Yeah, so the first prayer is before sunrise and then the second two are like um, during the day before sunset and then the last two are after sunset. Like way after sunset? Yeah, like when the sun goes down. Um, how about in the middle of the night? Do we ever have to pray then? Uh, well, the the first one that we do before sunrise, 
I guess, well, no, that's not middle of the night, but it's like before, it's like around 5 a.m. or something. Depending on this season. And in public spaces, you can also pray, like in a, in a plaza or a street. Yeah. But it's a hardship too. Yeah. So, um, and so this is mm -hmm. uh, a second thing. So how do we know, can you just pray facing any direction you want? Uh, no. So there's like an app. Um, there's like a specific direction that the, um, what is it called? Qibla. Uh, yeah, the Qibla, but um, like on the, I'm like blanking right now, but you know the thing that like spins and tells you what direction northwest? Compass. Or compass. A compass, yeah. Compass, a compass. A compass, yeah. Yeah, so there's yeah. a specific direction in the compass that you have to pay, pray towards. But it's different wherever you go in the world. So in Boston, you face uh, southeast. Yeah, it's different everywhere around the world. But in Northern Africa, you face Northeast. And in Asia, right. you face Northwest. Uh, and in uh, Siberia, you face Southwest. So this, this is hard, right? It's hard to pray five times a day. It's hard to know which direction to face. Uh, there is no magnetic compass that points to the Kaaba in, uh, in Mecca. Um, and so it's difficult. Uh, so Islam is a challenge. Uh, and once during our lifetime, we are obligated to travel, if we can, if we, are, if we have the means, we are obligated uh, to travel to Mecca uh, the second month after Ramadan uh, to perform Hajj. And during the month of Ramadan, which uh, comes every year at a slightly different time, Zahar, when, when is Ramadan this year? It's coming up in May. Okay. And um, so we, we fast. Go ahead, Zahar. Yeah. I was saying, I guess a lot of it seems like a challenge for outsiders, but for someone who grew up with the religion, um, like I was born and raised a Muslim. So for me, it's not, it's just something I know I have to do. It's like brushing your teeth twice a day. So yeah you pray, you pray five but, times a day yeah sometimes i forget but yeah well this gets to urban form um we'll pick up on this later um but there are five things we're obligated to do as a muslim and i'm speaking in empathetic voice which is a architectural ethical obligation to understand other people um so uh we pray five times a day and there are four others right Uh, can you repeat that? There are five obligations. In this oh thing. yeah, um, there's praying five times a day. There's Hajj. There's fasting. Um, During Ramadan, fasting. Yeah, yeah Ramadan and uh, zakat. What? Uh, paying zakat. Oh yeah, zakat. Oh, thank you, Joshua. And oh. there's one more that I'm blanking out on right now. I'm blanking too. Joshua, help us out. So while we're working on that, what is zakat? Zakat is like um, like offering. Well, not offering, but like um, yeah, it's sort of an offering that you're supposed to give to um, like uh, the the needy during Ramadan. Yeah, it's like a donation that you have to give um, according to how much money you make. You have to give yeah. some of it. There's like a percentage you have to give to like... Is it 10%? I'm not you know, sure. It depends on how, how much you... Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't yeah, know. it depends on how much you make. I'm not sure. Because yeah. It's like... I think, tax. I think it's like a little filing. bit more than that. Filing okay. tax. Yeah. Yeah. So, tax. so it's like... Um, Whoever's the head of the family, since I'm like relying on my father right now, so he pays it. Mm. Sort of like a type. Yeah, except for it's for the needy. <laughs> it helps people. And is it for needy Muslims or is it for the needy? No, and anyone. Anyone. Really? Yeah. Yeah. 
So even uh, non-believers. Yep. yep. Okay. Interesting, right? Yeah. Who knew? So um, this comes into play in the architectural form. All of these things. Um, so let me see. How do I? Okay. And uh, so. Um, And so uh, these rules, uh, these practices, these cultural uh, understandings um, that are all codified in the holy books, in the teachings and the legal practices. Islam is a religion that actually has um, a very strong uh, legal practice. And it, it helps us understand how uh, global trade occurred prior to the European, like we talked about this uh, last, last week in last week's lecture, that the Portuguese uh, and the Spanish, the Dutch and the English all wanted to know where these damn spices were coming from. Everybody's, uh, just think of the fortune I could make if I could find the source of these spices. Well, for several centuries, like five or six centuries, Muslim traders, held those secrets very tightly. Europeans would send spies, wave after wave of spies to find out where the source of the spices were, but there was a code of silence to protect those sources. And it took centuries of violence and espionage for the Portuguese to finally find the source of, of those spices. The other thing that was interesting is that uh, while the spice trade was occurring under Muslim trading, uh, it was not this exploitive uh, process of violence and oppression because of the code of ethics that, uh, that uh, put, uh, put limitations on how much a merchant could make from each transaction. Uh, it, there were ethical standards in the operations of business and uh, there were codes of ethics and trust so last week, we talked a lot about how the architecture of the fish market and the stock exchange, uh, the architecture was an architecture that reinforced the structures of trust, such that uh, <clears throat> the, which is the basis of all modern capitalism. That without the mechanisms of trust dependably being in place, you could not have paper money you could not have paper stock certificates, and you could not have long distance trade the way we take for granted today. And so there is an ethical system of trust embedded in capitalism in its op as an operating system that uh, uh, without which capitalism could not operate. Um, but the, cap the operating system of capitalism is fine with exploitation. It's fine with uh, uh, destructive, extractive practices, violence against humans, violence against the planet, uh, stripping away resources, dumping of pollution. That's all fine in the operating systems of extractive capitalism as we have inherited it today. Sorry about that. Um, but there are other operating systems that were hugely successful uh, for century after century, and Islam is one of them. The operating system of Islam governed the global trade networks uh, for centuries prior to the European uh, uh, domination. And they also, this operating system, uh, the way it worked, it was very much part of the built environment. And without the architecture, without the urban form, uh, the operating system of Islam as a global trade system, as a global religion, as a cultural phenomena of ordering uh, vast populations of the planet, it simply could not operate. So it, it's, a, it's a brilliant and fascinating example of complexity at work in our world throughout history and up to the present. Um, and so it helps us understand some of the challenges we face uh, when we're trying to understand natural systems. Uh, is this random? Is this formation chaotic? No, there are forces that are driving these forms. And as architects, uh, the skills uh, uh, that we are trying to 
develop uh, would help us uh, decode and understand and be able to reproduce and then work with these highly complex systems such that we can get our design interventions to do what we need them to do. Some of them are uh, biological, some of them are zoological. This is a swarm of birds. The movement of these bird forms, and I'm sorry I don't have the video, um, are explainable by very complex mathematical formulations. We are still struggling to do it. And once we understand things like this, we can start to understand things like the informal city. And we can start to uh, intervene in natural systems and man-made systems in ways that leverage and take advantage of the fact that we understand complexity. This is the artwork of Andy Goldsworthy. Uh, if you've ever taken the forces behind the forms uh, that are operating underneath uh, and between these formations. And then he joins with those forces and forms, engages uh, those forces and forms creatively in order to produce remarkable things. Is this nature or is this uh, man-made? Uh, Yes, to both. And urban formations are not that different. Um, and so uh, we can stare at this for hours. And in the first 10, 20 minutes, all we see is chaos. But as we start to uh, notice the patterns, we start to see circulation routes. We start to see differences in rooftops. We start to see the courtyards at the center of every house. We start to see, and if we've read uh, Hisham Mortada's work, uh, we start to see uh, patterns in the roof forms, and we start to see the covered street of the soup running in the lower half of relationships. We might see one building that is slightly turned uh, toward Mecca, and that is the mosque. Um, and so we might see towers, those are the minarets, where the Adzan calls us to prayer. Uh, and so the complexity of these urban formations uh, are really a useful thing for us to try to decode and develop those skills. Um, and so here we see a mosque. Uh, this is, I don't know if you've, you know about David Macaulay. Some of you might have grown up with the books of David Macaulay. Um, he is an architect, graduate of Rhode Island School of Design in the 1970s, and uh, he has written a dozen or so children's books, so-called, but they are brilliant examples of using the tools and methods of architectural representation to decode and make sense of the world. Uh, and uh, he has tackled uh, the Islamic city uh, beautifully. Um, from here, a representation of the mosque, the key ingredients of the mosque, the mihrab, uh, the minaret, uh, the courtyard in front. Um, and uh, But most impressively for us in this course, uh, it's, it's almost as if, um, you know, we see patterns in New England where you have a common, we talked about the common last week, uh, how the commons is a shared piece of property, uh, shared equally by everyone. And in the New England tradition, you put a congregational church at the top of the common and you arrange the homes of the farmers around the common, the green, and out behind their homes, that's where the barn and the outbuildings, I could turn my camera out the window and see one um, where I am now, uh, the barns, and then beyond the barns, radiating out from the common, you see wedge-shaped pieces of agricultural land that simultaneously puts people into social connection with each other around the green, 
with the church at the top of the green and uh, and that is the the classic New England town formation where every household has its own agricultural lands but it also uh, puts the homes of the Christian citizens of the New England town up close to the common green so that there is a social formation that uh, is intimately connected with the form of the town. And then there is the famous governmental system of New England towns, of the town meeting. So they would congregate in the congregational church uh, for a monthly meeting where uh, it's not about top-down dictatorship of the mayor. Uh, it's about the townspeople in the town meeting tradition uh, determining for themselves, thus the term self-determination. And so this is, the New England town is a similar phenomena where there is a religious component, a governance component, a legal component, and an urban form architectural component. And that's uh, the closest thing I can think of in Christianity to uh, the complexity and intricate uh, integration of Islam between uh, the religious practices and the urban form, where at the center of the formation there is a mosque with its minaret, its courtyard out front, uh, the necessity of ablution, cleaning prior to um, um, so a lot, um, and I'm using a lot of Arabic terms. I'm sorry, I, I, I learned all this stuff when I was living in Indonesia, and so it's a lot of it is slightly different than the original version. Um, but the, the prayer five times a day after clean uh, ablution uh, happens at the center of this formation. Um, and then there is the madrasa, which is the school uh, that that exists uh, away from the direction of Mecca and the market. Uh, sometimes uh, it's a market street of the souk. And um, the call to prayer comes from the top of the minaret. Every Muslim is obligated to live within the, the uh, sound of the adzan uh, with his call to prayer or her call to prayer in recent years. Uh, and so the urban formation, the scale of the urban formation is the pedestrian scale. And the scale is determined by the distance a human voice can carry uh, unamplified in the older tradition uh, from the top of the minaret. And so you get urban formations, the size of which are determined by how far a voice carries. The building traditions are very much, just as Roman architecture is built on the understandings of Greek architecture, but with the addition of arches and domes in Rome that the Greeks didn't have. Similarly, Islam builds on top of Roman architectural understandings with the addition of multiple, very complex uh, geometrical construction, the use of bricks, and mortar uh, to produce squinches, these, uh, these uh, reconciliations between the square, the square plan and the circular plan of the dome uh, is held up by these complex uh, semi-domes uh, called squinches that you may have seen uh, in Hagia Sophia in the history of architecture. And so you see all these uh, things, the, uh, the building traditions, uh, reconciling rectilinear plans, uh, square plans, supporting domes. And when you see this, you start to understand some of the forms we saw from the aerial views. Uh, the spanning of, of multiple modular structural bays through domes. <clears throat> and the grand architectural traditions of Islamic architecture is something that uh, there are entire schools of architecture uh, devoted to the study of the interplay between social formations and architecture, uh, two of which are in Cambridge, one at Harvard, one at MIT, Niaga Khan, 
uh, program uh, in Islamic architecture. And so it's possible to go very deep uh, into these topics. Um, uh, our primary concern is less in the building technology of Islam as shown here with these fascinating uh, reconciliation of the arched, the arches at the center of this image, uh, moving through the use of pendentives to start to curve around very slightly, uh, almost octagonally at the bottom, and then softening the sharpness of the octagon as you move up. And by the time you get to the point of the keystones of these three arches, you are actually, uh, you've achieved the goal of moving from a square plan to a round plan. A really fascinating and very sophisticated geometry. And this study of Islamic cities has compelled, the complexity of the structures has compelled a more sophisticated way of drawing. It has compelled architects to develop uh, ever more sophisticated methods for drawing. Uh, looking at these drawings, these are all by Klaus Herdag, a German architectural historian who famously uh, took students year after year from Colombia to uh, different cities of the Islamic world with uh, the task of measuring and drawing the fabrics of these cities. And do you remember the Noli maps uh, of Rome? Uh, that were drawn in 1746. Um, hopefully you do. Um, uh, but those, that method of drawing uh, fragments of cities as if it were architecture. So drawing a plan of a city the bathing places, all of these. <clears throat> How are we doing? Are we back? Okay, let's assume we're back. Um, but all of these uh, shared spaces that are not closed off to uh, the practicing Muslims of Isfahan in this case. Uh, these places are shown as architectural plans. And the places of privacy, they are shown, they are de-emphasized uh, by providing less detail about the plan, by only providing the outline of the roof forms uh, in relationship to the circulation patterns. And so we de-emphasize the parts that are private and inaccessible to us uh, as we move through the city. And then as practicing Muslims, we have access to these spaces. Some are exterior, some are interior. We show them uh, the way we would show uh, the plan of a building. Similarly, we zoom in and we see these types of representation of very sophisticated uh, development of understanding. And you can decode this in your mind if you realize that you cannot span huge spaces uh, with masonry structures the way we've been looking at these uh, building systems. And so the large open spaces of white, those are unroofed. Uh, we read those as open to the sky. And then when we move in and look at these more cellular structures, these are places that are roofed over, often with domes. And uh, we see circulation patterns. And where we see the, uh, the cellular structure of both sides of a street, uh, often this is, these are shopping streets that would have been covered with either solid masonry roofing, or if the street is slightly wider, it might be uh, covered with uh, textiles to provide a shaded environment 
uh, because believe it or not, um, the sun is not a good thing to let shine uh, on people. And so we move towards axonometric representations where we start to get a sense of the three-dimensional, the vertical dimension, the minarets. Uh, and uh, by using line weights very carefully, you see this emphasis of these structures that are part of the shared infrastructure of uh, Isfahan. In, in that previous slide, Robert, there were two buildings oriented probably towards La Meca, two, two, two mosques, mosques probably. Yes, the, um, the ones Korea. that turn. Yes, exactly. Yes. Those two, the, this one and the one in the left side. Yes. Um, and so this is another way to decode uh, and to apply our understanding of the complexity of cities. And so we zoom in, we start to get a sense of the, uh, the structure of these uh, neighborhoods. And at this scale, you can start to read these circulation patterns in relationship to homes. And you will recall from the reading that these are examples of homes that are structured around courtyards. Just as the mosque is structured around courtyards, the madrasa school is structured around courtyards, so too the homes are structured around courtyards. And so you can actually identify uh, the boundaries of homes by uh, tracing the courtyards. And uh, the, the drawings that these Columbia students uh, produced in the 1970s uh, continue to be very influential on how we draw cities, regardless of whether they're Islamic cities or, or any city. And some of these fabrics, um, you will recall from the reading um, that the house, here we are in North Africa, I believe, um, the house form operates, uh, performs a similar function as to the veiling of women. There is a privacy uh, behind the veil and the house operates in a similar way of safeguarding the privacy. Um, Mortada goes into great depth about the alignment of doorways and windows and how important it is to uh, build our homes in relationship to other homes, in relationship to streets and, and shops such that uh, the, the gaze of strangers does not uh, penetrate into the inner sanctum of the homes. And the, the uh, rooms of the home are oriented towards these courtyards and towards the light. And so the outer uh, structures, the, the arrangement of rooms around these courtyards changes everything. Here's a remarkable uh, drawing that is a, we call it a worm's eye view, because this is uh, step one, you become a worm and you go down underground about, uh, I'm going to say 50 meters. And then you look up and you wave a magic wand because you can, you're an architect, and you make the earth into a transparent medium. You can see through the earth. You can't see through the architecture. So the, the, where the structure meets the ground turns black, as in a figure ground drawing. But then you look up through the space and you experience the underside of the vaulting of the roof form. And so we can project ourselves into these spaces and experience them through the architect's projection uh, into what it must be like or what it might be like to be in these spaces. This is, again, it's called a worm's eye view perspective, uh, axon. Uh, and this goes on and on. Uh, again, this architect, uh, the author of these works is Klaus Herdeg. Uh, the books are in the library um, and these images are often available online. Um, and so this is the thing about the courtyard house, um, that it's at the edge uh, to the extreme right and left, there are uh, mason, solid masonry walls often unpenetrated by windows because it's often a party wall uh, with neighbors to the right and left. 
and only one of the four facades of a rectilinear parcel will have windows facing out towards a circulation path. And on the other three sides, the walls will be blank because they're shared with neighbors and friends don't let friends put windows on the exterior walls where you can look out into your neighbor's uh, house and they and the, the light and air all um, mediated through the architectures of that courtyard. Part of the architecture of the courtyard is uh, the inclusion of water, trees, shade, uh, walkways. And if this looks like Spanish architecture of, the, of Latin America, colonial Latin America, or the Southwest sure. of the United States, which is a colonial American construction, it's because uh, the influence of Islamic Spain uh, runs deep uh, throughout the Americas. Right. And here we go to India, Jeffrey uh, Bawa. If you ever wondered what's the best way to draw a tree, uh, you, you did this in sophomore year, but maybe it's uh, mm. useful to refresh your memory. Um, what is the best way for an architect to draw a tree and plan? This is the best way to draw mm. the architecture of a tree and plan, uh, where you can actually recognize the species that Jeffrey Bauer is using. And this is a similar arrangement of a courtyard house, where the house is designed and constructed in the context of a very dense neighborhood of Colombo, Sri Lanka, off the south uh, east coast of India. And so there's a series of courtyard gardens around which every room of the house is oriented. So every room in the house has uh, a window that opens onto one or two or three gardens um, that are lushly um, gar uh, planted. Uh, I was privileged to visit a few years ago um, on one of my tours of Asia, and uh, I should be including images that I took. This is not an image I took, but it's one of my favorite images in the world. Um, it's a different house, but a similar arrangement where uh, you you lose track very quickly of what's indoors and what's outdoors. And this is to remind you again of what you learned in sophomore studio, that the architecture does not end where the air conditioning ends. The architecture has left the building. So um, I'm not sure if we have a lot of time to go into this, um, but one of the things that happens when we when we get exposed to these alternative approaches to architectural form is we suddenly become aware of our own uh, operating systems. Like what is the deal with American cultures of architectural full, uh, experience of American architects? Uh, first of all, our own cultural biases are invisible to us. Um, when asked um, what is American culture, Oftentimes, people will say, ah, America doesn't have a culture per se. It doesn't. Who speaks with an accent? Do I speak with an accent? No, I have no accent. Um, I speak normal. But as soon as you go to another part of the world and you hear all these people with accents, you realize, uh, and when they start making fun of your accent, you realize, oh, maybe I do speak with an accent. And then you also, when you see these, when you're exposed to these other cultural systems, you start to recognize, oh, maybe America does have uh, an architectural operating system that I'm just not sensitive to because I take it for granted. So one of the things we take for granted in the American architectural operating system is that buildings are objects that sit in the center, more or less, of every parcel. And uh, that's how you do a building. Well, the courtyard architecture system uh, is the opposite of that. 
the thing you are designing at the center of every parcel is the courtyard. And even in the modern setting, uh, these modern buildings in Kuwait City that one of uh, the students of this course, uh, this is where he grew up, this is his house where he grew up. This courtyard system uh, prevails to right to the very present. And uh, in these modern houses, um, houses move out towards the boundary with solid walls and all rooms are oriented inward towards the courtyard. The opposite of the North American operating system where every house sits at the center of a parcel, surrounded by the lawn that God put on the earth from sea to shining sea. Um, um, and all the windows point outwards towards our neighbors. So in a rare spasm of trying to be sophisticated uh, in this uh, building code in Riyadh, they decided to be more like the modern Americans and they required a one meter set uh, and, windows, and, a courtyard, and windows pointed outwards towards the neighbors. Well, it, it didn't turn out so well. You get these useless spaces. Maybe it's two meters set back. But you get these useless spaces between buildings. And you also are in direct violation of the, the building codes of Islamic practices, uh, which is the dominant religion of this place. So after this brief experiment, in imposing culturally inappropriate building code standards from North America into the Islamic world, it was quickly abandoned. And you see uh, this award-winning um, multifamily dwelling uh, complex by Raj Wawal, uh, winner of the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, uh, where even with a multifamily dwelling, we return to the practice of courtyard formation of uh, residential complexes. And it wasn't too long ago that uh, one of the two sophomore studios would be the design of a courtyard house in Cairo. And we don't do that anymore, but um, so I'm trying to emphasize it here because you did not benefit from that experience. Uh, the An awareness that what we do here in North America is not necessarily the norm everywhere in the world, nor should it be. Uh, it is one specific cultural system. Uh, and so an appreciation of the complexity of cultural operating systems is not just uh, an approach we take to the cultural system of Hindu Balinese religion in terms of agriculture and temples and villages. It's not just something, uh, an approach we take uh, to the study of Islamic cities once you've taken this approach to cultures that are unfamiliar, these methods become suddenly vividly available uh, for us to apply to our own cultural systems and to appreciate just how specific and just how uh, restrictive these uh, cultural systems are uh, in the operation of our architecture. I'm sensing a disturbance in the operation of my system. Let me um, see what's going on. lots of things that we could be talking about in Islamic architecture and urban form. Uh, I was fortunate to co-teach this course uh, in 2018 with uh, Professor Ali Khodo of the American University in Beirut. And he um, gave us access to this wealth of slides um, that he has uh, collected over the years. Okay. 
So um, maybe what we'll do is we will open this up uh, to questions um, rather than attempting to just show you pic pretty pictures of Islamic cities. Um, let's, uh, you know, there's a lot that we could get into in terms of the sophisticated uh, ecological irrigation systems of the oases. Um, how uh, these wind towers were used to uh, create evaporative cooling uh, in some of these areas by capturing the cooling impact of water evaporating as warm air flows over it. These are wind towers that are capturing Uh, just suffice it to say that uh, the, the study of these things uh, goes very deep. Here's some of the elaborate geometries of uh, the Mukarnas uh, squinches um, that uh, we are st have fascinated architects for centuries. And computer scientists are still trying to figure out how you get mosaic tiles, uh, what is the mathematics that are required in these geometric shapes of domes. This is uh, called non-Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry is uh, geometries that are understood by the application of rectilinear XYZ uh, Cartesian uh, coordinates. Um, these are much more complex of uh, double curvature uh, spaces, double curvature forms upon which these flat elements are applied. Uh, computer scientists and architects struggle. Um, I was unable to get my tiling people on a project in, uh, in Java to um, understand these principles. Um, and then a second crew came in, and they were aghast at the tile job um, that was produced by the people who didn't understand the traditions of Islamic tile setting. Um, Manuel, do you have anything to add on this topic? Um, are there any questions that people have? I'm sorry, I was muted uh, when you when I answered. This, this is the mosque, Cordoba Mosque, uh, which is a cathedral. It's a it's a it's the Islamic mosque and also a cathedral. They have the two functions, and basically they have they have both rituals uh, actively. They do praying in. For Islamic world, and they also do ceremonies and of 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 his, of, of his uh, masses and and all Christian activities in the cathedral. And um, this is the photo famously used as the example in um, Will um, mm -hmm. Will Allen's uh, analysis that we used as the example. Right. Um, so it was originally the site of a Roman temple that then became the site of a Christian church that then with uh, the coming of Islam and Islam didn't sweep through uh, Spain and eliminate all Christian practice. It was, again, a cosmopolitan tolerant coexistence between uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, whatever. And, uh, and so this was part of a cosmopolitan formation where uh, the church uh, was converted to a mosque and the mosque was expanded out from this center um, towards the courtyard in successive waves. And then um, after uh, Ferdinand and Isabella took over and they did banish uh, Muslims. Um, if you were a Muslim in Spain, you would have to convert to Christianity or uh, at least convincingly um, tell people that you were converting to Christianity. 
uh, or be expelled or murdered. Um, and so uh, the violence of this was not something uh, that occurred during the Islamic period. Um, and the uh, complexity of each successive wave of expansion of this building, whether it was by uh, uh, the church or uh, Islam, uh, is something really interesting to look at. And the um, Samarkand uh, is one of the truly remarkable urban formations. Um, the bathing rituals, the Grand Mosque of Damascus. Mm -hmm. So just a, a quick uh, kind of preview of the kind of richness and complexity that um, is part of the study of the Islamic city. So I think we'll just um, leave it there. So what questions about anything? Why don't we um, turn on our cameras, um, turn on our microphones, and ask questions. So I'm looking through the chat. Are there any questions that rise to the top that are worth um, addressing as a group? Say. Or Jaime, some very good questions here. Brianna, do you want to share what you wrote? What I wrote in the chat? Yeah. Um, so I was actually responding to somebody um, I forget who I was responding to. Oh, Yona. I was responding to Yona because she said um, we're losing the culture and those important architectural values in our city. And I said that um, in response to that, I said we're believing, we're, I believe that we are also leaning more towards like modern architecture and kind of going like bigger and better versus where we're losing the individuality of our, our city's culture is becoming lost as we all try to go towards the more modern approach. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think it's a little bit of both because as Where is we... Brianna, by the way? I'm sorry to interrupt. Where are you, Brianna? Where? I'm right here. <laughs> what happened? Uh, okay. Um so tall. So... You're not you're not so tall. Okay. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. but I think it's a bit of both because I believe that we should have individuality as cities. Um because it kind of gives like more of a sense of home and like a reason to go to these cities. It could, but if they all start becoming more like uniform and modern, it's kind of just like the only difference would be like language and kind of like how people interact versus just having the different land, like architecture and stuff. Yeah. Also um, there's the, there's also the consideration of the Anthropocene judging by the outcomes of the 20th century when every city became more and more the same uh, it didn't turn it hasn't turned out so well um, imposing a sameness across the planet um, and so what other options are there for us I mean we don't want to go back in time and become uh, you know live the way we did in medieval times uh, uh, so how do we move forward without erasing difference? 
which is really kind of the challenge of this generation. Do you see it that way or do you see it differently? Or is there a way you can describe it uh, with more nuance? Uh, anyone? And what about suburbia? Right now, I mean, in this course, we've talked about not just suburban sprawl from the uh, automobile domination, but more seriously, how through the popularity of movies and advertising and you know, rock and roll and popular music, that uh, everyone in the world is looking at the United States as an example of what their lives are going to look like uh, in the future. So the suburban sprawl, uh, automobile dependency, these are things that uh, more and more people uh, around the world are taking for granted mm -hmm. as their future. This is what their future is going to look like. So even as we in the, we in the United States are starting to look for more sustainable practices, you know, with Zoom, some people are leaving cities and moving to farmhouses out in the countryside in northern Vermont, um, uh, and maybe rediscovering what it's like to live around uh, the common, uh, and seeing if that holds a viable future, as long as you can find a, an internet connection or two. Um, you, in the meantime, in China, everybody's urbanizing, everyone is living, moving to high-rise condominiums. What is the deal with that? How much of this is good and how much of it is not so good? Well, you know, Robert, that also brings the topic of gentrif gentrification. In, in, in very importantly, because some people definitely is rejected to, to go farther away and some people is taking the place. So it's, it's also about power in the use of the space and in terms of the use of the space from certain communities that are displaced to another uh, another location where they, they have less access to the benefits of the city. So this this is a true pro political problem and something to something long to talk about. Yeah, mm. uh, Catriel is someone who's uh, dealt with gentrification uh, in his life experience and in his analysis. Um, what do you think about any of this, Catriel? I think um, it's valuable to go back on the things that you understand the best. And um, that's why I've done a lot of my own presentations um, on things that I understand about my own area. And then like looking at other people to understand what they know about other areas to learn from them. But um, kind of stabbing blindly at things that I don't understand is not really how I go about it. Reasonable. Um, uh, in the tools of analysis uh, are we develop these tools of analysis so that we can get it wrong uh, quickly in smaller and smaller ways understanding that um, you know before i came to boston i knew nothing about nubian square uh, but i bring my skills and i face the obligation i i have to understand the world around me. If I'm going to deal with uh, the built fabric of Nubian Square, I had damn well better quickly learn as much as I can from the people who live there uh, about how to make sense and decode uh, what I'm seeing and experiencing in terms of the history of Nubian Square and the forces of gentrification that are threatening the fabrics. Um, and so we can't always limit ourselves to uh, the situations that are familiar. Also, there's great benefit to going out into the unfamiliar, developing the skills of decoding those unfamiliar settings and bring them back 
so that we can uh, understand uh, what we thought we understood, uh, but from a new perspective with the benefit of these skills that architecture gives us. What do you think of that, Katriel? Yeah, it's, it's reasonable. Sometimes I feel like uh, the time frame that I have to understand a new area is like uh, limited with the amount of work that I have on other things. So I can't always get it done. But uh, when I do, I have been doing some stuff on other places of Indonesia and how like Kabusi are in like uh, the grid has kind of made this weird uh, interface with how um, India has like developed some of their cities and like how interesting that is and how it doesn't work in some ways. Sorry, I cut out a little. Can you say oh, that again, Katria? Sorry. I was just saying that uh, I've been looking at some other cities as well, but often my timeline for figuring out new places is pretty limited with other work that I have. Absolutely. Um, and so it's really about striking a balance um, between what we, you know, realistic attitude towards what we can achieve in a short amount of time, but doing it anyway, doing the best we can so that we can get better and better at it. Again, in school, we hope that you take risks, uh, that you try things out because we're in a safe space. You can get it wrong without doing great damage uh, because we're not yet uh, being entrusted by clients. Um, so this is the time to try things out, take, take risks. You're in a safe space and we are here uh, in a supportive structure to encourage experimentation, exploration, discovery, and uh, see what you can make of it uh, using your tools of architectural design. Anything else, Paul? Anything else, anyone? Okay, well, maybe um, we end it there while we still have some internet connectivity and um, we, will, we will stay on the line uh, for anyone who wants to talk about anything, um, but for everybody else, thank you very much. Uh, we will see you on uh, Wednesday. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat>